Let me finish with the five commitments. Fifteen years ago, it was hard work, and as I was preparing this uh, fresh last night, I went back to a paper I gave to a bunch of Christian lawyers back in 1997. And I think that maybe the five commitments are still valid. We could tick the box, maybe, for most of them. But here they are. The commitments I would ask you to make as a church to your children, your, your communities. First of all, we will make concern for the victim and protection of other children our highest priorities. Mm -hmm. And what that means in practice is that when it comes to hard choices, we will make the choice which keeps children safe. Mm -hmm. This is a very real issue. Um, which all churches face with the ambiguities and the uncertainties. Did he do it? Did he not? Uh, situations where somebody hasn't been convicted, they've been charged, the police have, the police have dropped the, the charges, what do you do? Well, the High Court in Australia in another case years and years ago, unrelated to um, this, but to do with sexual abuse in the family, said the test is one of unacceptable risk. Is the risk unacceptable. Can you sleep at night knowing you've taken that risk? And if you can't, then you need to make the decision which keeps children safe. Unacceptable risk. And my view on this is that when you deal with volunteers in our, our, our church programs, well, it's wonderful that they volunteer. If they want to volunteer to do the washing up rather than help with the kids' ministry, that's fine. But there's no reason why we should let everybody into the church children's ministry just because they express an interest in it. If there's an unacceptable risk, that's an easy judgment call. Yeah. Much harder with the pastor. Much harder when you've got pastors or paid professionals who are being accused of impropriety. Then it becomes quite, quite difficult. But at the end of the day, we commit to make concern for the victim and the protection of other children our highest priorities. Secondly, cooperating fully with the civil authorities. I think we're over the stage now when we would act in private and try to keep these things indoors, but we certainly haven't been in the past. Even if there's no conviction, we will resolve the issue of whether the person is suitable to continue in ministry. And this is a really fundamental thing. You get people who are charged, the charges are dropped, and not charged at all, or, or, or whatever. But we have an independent duty to determine whether that person is suitable for ministry. And if I can just go quickly back, back to this, it's really important that we focus on fitness for ministry, not proof of the offence. Mm -hmm. Just a year ago, I was chairing a tribunal for another denomination involving a minister, and none of the <coughs> offences that he was accused of could be, be, be sustained. I agreed with the analysis of the investigator who said none of this could be sustained. But there were still issues of fitness for ministry because he had certainly crossed a lot of, a lot of, a lot of boundaries with an adult woman, a married woman uh, in his congregation. So he crossed a lot, a lot of boundaries and so behaved in very inappropriate ways. And so we dealt with that question, not by focusing just on did he do what he was accused of, maybe, maybe not, but looking at the whole picture of what has been um, this minister's history. It wasn't a serious case. Uh, it wasn't a case of serious boundary violations. Our recommendation was he should continue in ministry. But we recommended putting in place a number of safeguards and asking him to address the issues that um, had led to the complaints in the first place. We have to take a cumulative approach, not just did he do this or did he not, which is a focusing on the individual thing, but looking at the whole picture of is this person fit for ministry. It's really, really critical. We must apply the principles of natural justice in disputed cases. Uh, we need uh, any of you who are mentored or tribunals to be rigorously fair. Not least because we'll be taken to court if we don't. But those rules exist for a reason. Um, in that case I was telling you, you about, um, there was an investigation report. This guy was initially dismissed from the ministry. Um, he hadn't seen the investigation report. Hadn't had a chance to, res to respond to it. So the first thing we did 
was to insist that he be shown the investigation report and be given a chance to respond to it. Not rocket science, you may, you may, you may, you may, you may say, but um, it hadn't happened. The church, in that case, had not followed its own pr 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 procedures, hadn't given him natural justice, and we were able to recommend to the church that they accepted a very different outcome from the one that had first been decided. And I have to say that you know, sometimes you can get caught up in inter-church conflicts. This person had a particular history, that it controversial, his church was controversial within the d denomination, and I think a lot of those things lay behind the breach of natural justice. In that case, they wanted to get rid of him, and, but that wasn't fair. Finally, we will avoid systems abuse, in which the complaint is abused by the church <coughs> for procedures. When you have a complainant, is she a witness for the prosecution or somebody for whom Christ died? So often what we do is we treat people as a witness for the prosecution, just part of the church's evidence in the case. But it can be incredibly stressful, incredibly difficult to give evidence. It can be humiliating, humbling. And we need to be really concerned about the victim, the complainant, and making sure that she's not abused by church procedures, making sure as far as we can, by allowing fairness to the person accused, that she's treated with love, with, re with respect, and with concern for her well-being. And not just because she can give an account of what happened in the case. Ken, I might leave it there, but can I ask you to think about those five commitments? What are we doing well in the SDA? What are we, what, 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 what are we not? and renewing our commitment to keeping children safe. Thank you.